Area 941 podcast are produced and distributed by Community Powered 94.1 KPFA Radio. Please help support Area 941 at kpfa.org. This is the Bay Area Theater Podcast. I'm Richard Walensky with interviews conducted over the years and during the pandemic with playwrights, directors, actors, and producers. This podcast was first posted on May 30th, 2018. My guests are Pamela Gray, who is the playwright, and Cheryl Caller, who is the director of a new musical, A Walk on the Moon, which is based on the 1999 film with a screenplay by Pamela Gray. Cheryl Caller is a Tony-nominated director whose most recent Broadway play was Mothers and Sons by Terrence McNally in 2014. And among Pamela Gray's other screenplays are Music of the Heart and more recently, Megan Levy. A Walk on the Moon deals with life in a Jewish bungalow colony in the Catskills during the summer of 1969 and the sexual awakening of a mother and daughter. Pamela Gray, A Walk on the Moon was originally a film. Let's talk first about the origins of the film before we get into the origins of the show. Did your family hang out at a bungalow colony in the Catskills during the summer? Yes, we'd been doing that since I was a baby. That time period in my life was very special as a child because we lived in a treeless part of Brooklyn, and I loved going in the country. And then when my brother was born, we went up there with him. And it wasn't until I was a teenager that I felt trapped and that I didn't want to be there anymore. Our life was the life portrayed in the film where my father had to work during the week and only came up on the weekends. This was a working class world, women and children during the week, and through the years, I found myself describing bungalow colonies to people over and over again, even Jews who you know, went to hotels or didn't go anywhere in the summer. And the specialness of that world was foremost in my mind when I was in film school and coming up with an idea for my next screenplay. It became The Blouse Man was the name of the screenplay. What happens in the film is we have this family the Cantrowitzes, Pearl, who was played by Diane Lane, and Liv Schreiber played Marty, the husband. Allison, the daughter, who I guess was sort of you, though it's 1969, you were 13 and she's 14. Mm-hmm. That was Anna Paquin a couple of years before Suki Stackhouse. Viggo Mortensen, just before Lord of the Rings, is the blouse man who meets up with Pearl, and it's a coming of sexual awakening and, I guess, relating to the fact that it's 69, also the United States, quote, awakening with Woodstock. Mm -hmm. So what made you set it in the Woodstock year? Was it just because it seemed appropriate? Well, when I came up with the story, my first thought was, oh, well, summer of 67, summer of love. And it just took me a minute to get my history into my brain and realize that the juxtaposition of the moonwalk in July and Woodstock a month later, which was in the Catskill Mountains, made for a perfect structure and a perfect story about the changing times and the collision of those time periods because the people in the bungalow colonies were essentially living in the 50s or the early 60s. Also, I had an image that had stayed with me my whole life of being in the bungalow colony swimming pool area with the bubbies and the moms and the kids, chain link fence around it, and I saw the hippies walking past the fence on the way to Woodstock and holding signs, and I wanted to be on the other side of that chain link fence. felt like, what's wrong with this picture? I should be with them. I did not sneak off to Woodstock like... Anna Paquin does. She got to do what I couldn't do. But that clash of cultures, and not many people from outside that area realize that the Woodstock Music Festival was in the heart of Sullivan County with the bungalow colonies. In retrospect, that was one of the things that got me. I'm going, 
wow, you know, the Nevely, the Fallsview, all of them were almost walking distance from Yasger's farm. It was right there, yeah. Liberty Monticello area. Going back to you for a second, Cheryl Keller, uh, you're a little bit younger. What are your memories of that particular era that you could kind of relate to when it came time for you to enter the story? I grew up on Long Island, and my dad was part of a bowling league, the Temple Hillel Bowling League. So we used to go to the Homoac or the, you know, at, towards the end it was the Concord because we could afford it. So I kind of lived more the hotel life as a kid. My mother was a bit of a hippy dippy pearl. She was sort of pearl in that way, in that she introduced us to the Vietnam War. I wore a POW bracelet and my POW came home, which was amazing. And he wrote me a letter and thanked me. I'm post Woodstock. I'm definitely post Woodstock, but I'm not post Joni Mitchell and James Taylor. And I mean, I followed the dead around. I think I saw Joni Mitchell in concert like 20 times as a young person. So I feel like I'm not post the music, but I'm definitely post the time. My next door neighbor's boyfriend slept in a stables because he was allergic to horses. So I knew about evading the draft. So I think I could be like a little bit, even though Danny in the story, Allison's brother is only five or six or seven, we've upped his age a little bit for the play. I feel like my perspective is a little bit more like Danny's perspective. Because <laughs> you know, like the difference between nine and 12 is big. But for me, Pearl's story is extraordinary to me because I think we're still living in a world where women, the script isn't written for us. You know, we're not told how to raise our children and be directors. And, you know, the rules are constantly changing. I think that for me, I was so attracted to this because of Pearl's story and her coming of her not only sexual awakening, but her emotional and psychological awakening. So that's how I connect to the piece. Watching the movie, two things struck out. The performance by Diane Lane is luminous. You just can't take your eyes off her. The other thing, of course, is it has one of the best soundtracks I have ever heard for any film. What this all brings up at this point, here we are in 2018, is that when the film came out, it was Miramax. And in fact, Music of the Heart was also Miramax, which meant you were working with Harvey Weinstein. So before we move on, did you see anything from him that kind of presaged what came down 20 years later? Just bringing him up during the context of this interview, which is about something that gives us a joy, kind of feels, it's like bringing toxicity in the room. He was very tough. He was a bully. Miramax did not make the blouse man. They acquired it. And I did work with him actually two more times. He was a bully. So nothing surprised me. The film came out. How did it do? It did really well when it was in theaters. <laughs> it did well, in obviously, in Florida, New York, and L.A. And sadly, Miramax, they dumped it. They didn't put it in past 200 theaters. Harvey loved it. His mother said, you have to buy this movie. And then, you know, as studio people do, they move on. And so we didn't get the campaign we wanted. They didn't do an Oscar campaign. They didn't send out screeners. So I'm blessed to know that it has a cult following and that there's still people who come up to my mother on the street and say, that was my favorite movie. It's gone on. It has a life of its own, and it's thrilling to have it happen now as a musical. I think it would have done well if it had more of a life in the theater. I do think that, and I don't know if we ever discussed this, when you're adapting something for the stage, there's somehow a blessing that more people haven't seen it in that, you know, like when they try to bring Legally Blonde to the stage or even Mean Girls, because those movies did so well, because those performances, the storytelling in a film, which you can't 
replicate. You can just be inspired by to put it on stage. So like, I feel like Walk on the Moon, a lot of people haven't seen. And then this way, they don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And it allows us to retell the story in the framework of this feminist movement, this movement that's happening with young people rising against government and the repeat, as we always know, everything old is new again, the repeat of where the younger generation is in our time right now allows us to give the story with fresh eyes. So yes. in a way, that out of crap grew flowers for us, you know? Do you remember seeing A Walk on the Moon way back when? Oh, sure. I saw it, I guess, I probably saw it in the movie theaters, I guess. I do remember, I always say this, uh, there's this one cutaway of Pearl, Diane Lane. I lost my mom when I was young. And there was this look in Diane Lane's eyes and Pearl's eyes. And my mother used to have that look in her eyes. My mother used to have that faraway look like she was always looking. We belonged to a cabana in Lido Beach. And, you know, she would stand with all the Mahjong ladies. And sometimes she would just look past them. And as a kid, I didn't understand what that meant. And as an adult seeing the film or as a young adult seeing the film, I realized that she was looking to the future when she was stuck in a world that was very, very happy. I always say this about people who are like very religious. Like sometimes I wish I was the type of person who didn't question all the time, you know, who just found faith in saying the same prayers over and over again. And in the bungalow colony, the men and the women just doing the same thing every summer, they found happiness and security in that. And I really do believe my mother and Pearl and me and my daughters now, I have two daughters, We question a lot more. So yes, I remember seeing the film, and I remember wishing that I could have watched it with my mother. When I began watching it, I kept thinking, of course, of Dirty Dancing, which takes place in the Catskills Hotel, but always felt fake to me. But you captured something that is not in that film, which is what it was actually like to be in the Borscht Belt. And what it was actually like to be Jewish. (laughs) I mean, Dirty Dancing inspired me positively and negatively. So the negative was, this is de-Jewed. But the positive thing that came out of it was, I did recognize the experience of coming of age when I was in the fishbowl with my family. And I also recognized that no one knew from film what the bungalow colony experience was. And I was determined that I would be the first person to write a movie that was set completely in a bungalow colony, which is a different world. Just logistically, staying at a hotel for two weeks does not create the same kind of community as spending eight weeks with the same people and possibly year after year with the same people, this sort of almost shtetl community. Uh, female <laughs> driven during the week. So I wanted to capture that, the humor of it, the joy of it, and the challenges of being in that kind of enclosed environment. Was there actually a blouse man? Absolutely. Larry Leibowitz. He did not look <laughs> anything like Viggo Mortensen. All those vendors were real. In the film, I had wanted it to establish that they were like, you know, nice Jewish guys who came up in their station wagons or little school buses from Brooklyn. But we couldn't afford that. So, but the conceit of the story was, what if one of these vendors was this really good looking, not stereotypical hippie, but a hippie, someone from another world entering this world. So that was the conceit of the story. But it was a logical reason why the vendors were there. No one had cars. There were no two-car families among working-class Jews. So the women were stuck. My mother would describe that no matter what they were doing, they would put down the Mahjong tiles and go to the vendors because it was something to do. The other element, which I was wondering, as I started watching, and I assume that some of this must be in the play, is the fact that there's another adult there, which is the husband's mother. And having a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law together for eight weeks, you managed in the the movie to keep her from being a stereotype, which Tova Felcha helped. But as you're looking at the play, are you trying to maintain that same kind of relationship? Well, absolutely. Lillian is Lillian. She is not a stereotypical Jewish mother or mother-in-law. 
She's a composite of both my grandmothers, the one who lived with us until I was a teenager and who was my second mother in a lot of ways, and my father's mother, who was a professional psychic and fortune teller. My mother's mom, who lived with us, she became a widow in her 40s and was an independent working woman who supported my mom. So I had great role models, and Lillian is real, and I'd love Cheryl to just talk about how she has helped. We have a fabulous actress. Lillian's role in the musical is very pivotal, and I had this opportunity with Cheryl to increase that in the musical. I think we were really inspired by the film and also inspired by the fact that Lillian's younger than we are as a booby, you know, and she is rooting for her family. I think that the story that Pam's written is is timeless in a way that family, it's family, family first, family first, Wh- whether it's chosen family, whether it's bungalow family, whether it's your, do- you know, when you live with your son's daughter, she becomes your daughter. And so I feel like, you know, it was very easy for me because I think that the way that Lillian was originally written, we were able to adapt her for the stage just by virtue of the fact that she's younger than I am, <laughs> you know? And um I think that liberation in women comes in all forms. I don't think it's formulaic. That's the other part of this that we're exploring, that as women coming of age or coming to terms or coming to success or coming to any kind of coming, it comes in all forms and it can come in the form of a book too. And so I think that's where Lillian's motor comes from mm-hmm. for me. The movie comes out. You do a lot of other projects. What brings A Walk on the Moon back to life and then back to life as a musical? It never left me. It was my baby. It was the first script I wrote that was produced and it came from me. I worked on assignment primarily since that time. And it was someone else's idea to musicalize it. Another producer who is no longer in the picture. And it instantly sparked me. It made perfect sense to me that it could be a musical. I'd had a teenage dream to write musicals that was a dream deferred and forgotten Mm -hmm. until that moment. And I was thrilled to go back to it with fresh eyes, with the advantages of time, and learning all the ways that musicals work. I hadn't written one since I was 17 years old and probably didn't do it right. But to learn how you work from the songs backwards, you know, you're working in both directions, but what can be musicalized versus being said a very dialogue-driven writer. I'm really a playwright at heart, more than a screenwriter in some ways. I love people just talking, talking, talking. So Cheryl's been a great mentor to me in learning that. And again, like really reviewing those relationships and seeing how to heighten them and deepen them and getting a chance to still learn things about my characters from Cheryl, from the actors you know, I, I've been living with them. I started this script in 1991, and it is my family. My mother did not strip the blouse man, but these are my people. Um, my homeless shpucha is in the movie as extras. There's a wonderful close-up of my father during the moonwalk. He passed away two months ago, and having this way to double immortalize him, you know, he was the one who took us to the Catskills and made that possible. It just felt right. Where did Paul Scott Goodman, who wrote the music and lyrics, where did he come in? And was there ever any thought to using material from the original soundtrack? Paul Scott Goodman was part of the plan that these other producers had. When they wanted to develop it as a musical, they just assumed, I'd say, sure, here's my rights and let me know how it goes. They had brought in a book writer, And they had brought in Paul, who had started composing, and the book writer had started writing. And I said, no, I have to be a part of this. Same thing I just said. This is my baby. So that fell apart. But through the years, Paul stayed in touch with me. And I was very busy. I, You know, I just let it go on a lot of levels until I didn't, until at one point I responded to his email and said, okay, what do you have in mind? 
he had shown the material I'd created to Michael Greif, and they had a working relationship, and he said, Michael Greif wants to call you. And I was thrilled, and we found out we had something in common. We were both writing these high school musicals in Brooklyn a couple of years apart. And so we developed it with Greif for a couple of years, and then he went on to do Dear Evan Hansen, and we found Cheryl who made it all happen. Cheryl, how did you come into the picture? I was shopping at Nordstrom's and my agent called me three times in a row. So I decided to pick it up. And he said, do you know Pamela Gray? Do you know Paul Scott Goodman? Our commercial producers are named Ruth and Steve Hendel. Do you know anyone who knows Ruth and Steve Hendel? You need to go get this job. Greif had too much on his plate. I was recommended to them by about 800 people. (laughs) And Greif also is a friend of mine. So he was very gracious and also told Pam and Paul that I would be a good person for it because we also have our own director community that we all like each other or some of us like each other. So that's how I got it. At that point, you had no theater. You had just the idea of let's work on this thing. Was there a process of workshopping before it came to ACT? So we were lucky enough to have commercial producers. They had done a workshop with Michael at New York Stage and Film, which ironically is my creative home. As well as Michael's. That's where we met, really, at New York Stage and Film. And um, I had a relationship with Carrie Perloff and Andy Donald. And as soon as we like did one writing session in L.A., we, Paul and I flew out to work with Pam, which was our first writing session. And I said... I'd like to pick ACT to do it and let me see if I can, you know, call my friends. Andy called me back. Andy and I made our Broadway debuts together with a play called Next Fall. He was the artistic director of Naked Angels. And Andy said, you know, of course I'll read it. And we don't really do a lot of musicals here, but of course I'll read it. And then three days later, I got a phone call saying that they were interested in doing it. And then we had a Skype session with Carrie and Andy. And then three days later, I think after that, we had a booking at ACT. And that's kind of how it went down. <laughs> Can I well, tell, though, the story it, you If said, you build it, they will yes. come. <laughs> but I love the story you told me that oh. Cheryl found out after she called them that they had been planning their season like the day before you called yeah. and had it all laid out. And Carrie said, you know what we're missing? Something Jewish and something with music. And Cheryl called the next day. There's been a lot of that beshert, you know, meant to be feeling with this of magic happening. But, you know, Cheryl's relationship with ACT just made this happen. And the fact that they love Loved the material. And, and I think that San Francisco is the right town for it. You know, developing plays and musicals, the audience is the last character. So mm-hmm. for me, because I only work on new plays and musicals, mostly plays, really, it's who our last character is, which is the audience. So as soon as I read it, I think I even said to you, you know, it would be great to do this in San Fran. Yeah, it'd be great to do this in San Fran. Well, it sounds as if, Cheryl Collar, that on some level, you're not just the director here. You're also molding this. Had you worked on an original musical before? I worked on the only musical that Chris Durang ever wrote called Adrift in Macau with Peter Melnick, who's Richard Rogers' other grandson, not Adam Gettle, uh, Danny Melnick of movie producers. Uh, yeah, and I grew up going to musicals. And, you know, for me, a play is a musical and a musical is a play and it, it, it applies itself in the same way dramaturgically. And I feel like where Paul and Pam were so gracious is they just kind of invited me in and... I I don't do any of the writing, but I definitely do, you know, dramaturg, the exact translation of it is like architect, Mm -hmm. you know, so there's a lot of architecture and there's a lot of form and there's a lot of structure. Mm -hmm. And also because I grew up on Long Island, you know, there's so much of like even today, you know, one of the actors asked, did, did Sweet and Low ever come in anything other than packets? And I went, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I don't have to do that much research. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't do research on when basically research is a fictional movie called A Walk on the Moon. <laughs> but as you're doing this, I know that what Sondheim would do is he would have the play look at it, and I think this comes from Rodgers and Hammerstein, pull out sections and go, there, that's what we're going to musicalize. But this didn't work like that 
or did it? Oh, it did. I, I would say, yeah. I I had created a very detailed treatment, which I don't even think Cheryl's ever looked at, mm-hmm. and was asked by these other producers to figure out where things would be musicalized. So I had my vision, and then Paul, by the time Cheryl came to the party, Paul had his vision, and there were established songs, and then we talked about them, and we were in development together, because she had, she uses a wonderful phrase, baby eyes. So she came to it fresh, and the ideas about where to musicalize, they're still happening. It grows and morphs. Yeah, I think the thing about a musical that's so different from a play is that a play, it's the director and the playwright. In a musical, it's a much more detailed collaboration, and also not one person is right. So, like, for instance, our orchestrator, Michael Starabin, a two-time Tony Award-winning orchestra. I mean, like, you talk about Sondheim, you know, and literally last night we were sitting with him and the musical supervisor. I was sitting with him and the musical supervisor, Greg Anthony, and he said, you know, well, what I did in Merrily We Roll Along is bum, 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 and Pam was sitting there. And then Greg Anthony, from what Michael Starabin said, started writing motifs into our underscore. So it it's almost like the director of a musical is taming an octopus. <laughs> and it has all these tentacles, and you're just like, okay, let me be the head of this octopus. Uta Hagen once said in her book, she says, acting is 98% listening. I also think directing is 98% listening, and particularly on a musical. So not only am I dramaturging, I feel like I'm the conduit for all the departments. And that's what makes musicals take so long, and that's what makes musicals so challenging. When you're working with the music like this, it's not just the content, it's also the fact that this is 69 and also 2018. When Michael Starobin is dealing with that, are we listening to kind of acid rockish stuff? Are we just listening to modern music? What is the kind of framework that makes the entire musical pattern of the show special? Firstly, it starts in the script because what Paul and Pam came up with was that Ross, the young boy that Allison dates, they turned him into a guitar player. And Paul Goodman writes all of his music on a guitar. I think more about, less about that we're doing it in 2018, which yes, but I think what Michael uh, Starabin and Greg Anthony and me and Paul and Pam and uh, Greg Kinne, who's our musical director, and we just had a guitarist in the other day, and we can go on and on about this music team, I call them team music now, is that it's still a musical. You know, we're still doing musical theater. Sting tells this great story about Joe Montello, the Tony Award winning director who's a a friend of mine. And Sting said, what do you mean, Joe, that my songs have to tell a story and move the plot along? (laughs) You know, (laughs) I think that we are all this team and particularly with the genius of Michael Starabin and Greg Anthony and our sound designer, Tony Award winning Leon Rothenberg and Tony Award winning set designers. They're all making us answer to what is theater and what is the form of musical theater and therefore guitar score. You've decided no No source source material. It's all original songs. Yes. At this stage of the game, you must be pretty close. I mean, we're talking a couple of weeks before it opens. What kind of changes come on once the previews start? Because that must be scary as hell. Yeah, I always say, like, I teach a lot now. And I always say, you know, talent has nothing to do with being successful in show business. It's your skin and your spine. And theater can be done everywhere. You know, I grew up in New York. I chose the Broadway route because that was always my dream. That doesn't mean that theater is only valid on Broadway. But you do need a spine and a skin to be able to withstand that kind of stuff. I mean, we literally just just starting to put the second act together this morning. And I'm in literally two minutes about to tell Paul and Pam that I want to cut a song completely. When that happens, <laughs> I mean, how how willing are you sometimes to just hold on to a line or a song and go, no, that has to be in, when you know your dramaturg is sitting there going, this isn't going to work? Overall, I'm very flexible in a collaboration. I would agree. I, I would a, agree. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I would say 90% of the time, if I'm very stubborn about something, as soon as I figure out a way to make it feel like my decision and make it work creatively, I let it go. 
and there's heartbreak, and I'm already upset about what she's going to do in two minutes. And you know the song by now. I do. So, you know, I don't think we've come to this crossroads. I feel like we've, though, had this agreement that, like, no can also be an answer. Like, I feel like we we don't say no to each other a lot. So when we do say no, it it has weight and it has... Um, and it, 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 you know, I pay attention when you say no. Mm-hmm. I feel like she you, does. You, I really do. I feel like the word no means something because we don't use it very often with each other. No. Yes. <laughs> 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 Correct. Um, no, I am very, first of all, as a screenwriter, I'm used to, you know, the janitor has more power than I do over my lines. <laughs> so I'm used to that kind of compromise. I love this collaborative process. I love being part of the octopus. And Cheryl and I are very aligned, and her notes are great. And when I make changes, I feel good about them. And, yes, I get to say no, and we'll see what happens. Uh, Quickly, uh, the subplot of the girl and the boyfriend is still in there, I would assume. And much more developed. And it's really good. It's really great. <laughs> and is she the same age? Is she 14? Yes. yes. And you said that the son is older now. Just a little bit. I think that the difference between stage and uh, screen is you can cut together a performance. So a six-year-old with a big part on stage in a new musical where lines are changing is impossible. Whereas in a film, you can edit, you can say, say this line, you can stop the camera, say this line, stop the camera. Kind of how they used to say, who is that? Steven Seagal. They used to say, like, they would make him say one line at a time in all of his movies. So I called Pam when I was doing auditions and I said, we have to up the age a little bit because a six-year-old won't be able to handle what we have on stage. So we have two kids playing Danny and we've upped the age to seven slash eight and it's really working beautifully. Do you get a point where you have to go, okay, time to start cutting just because it's too long? Yes, we haven't gotten there yet. But you will at some point. And that's where it gets really ugly because you don't want to leave anything out. It's called killing your babies. Killing your babies or your darlings. (laughs) Pamela Gray, One question that I really have to ask that has nothing whatsoever to do with this. You were an intern in Star Trek The Next Generation, and you wrote a script for that, and that was actually your first script. How was it working with those folks? Oh, it was fun. I won a Television Academy Screenwriting Fellowship. I was in my first year of film school. I was a grown-up. You know, I was 35 years old, and I was competing in this contest with probably a lot of 20-year-olds. And your prize is a summer on the staff of a one-hour television show, and it just depends on which show it is. So I got a call from Michael Piller, the exec producer of Star Trek Next Generation, and said, you're our choice. And I said, I don't write science fiction. And he said, your Wonder Years spec script, which was what I wanted off of, was so brilliant and so character-driven, and this is a show about character. And I was very brave in the room. Again, I was a grown-up, and I gave an idea on my eighth day, and he said, gold star for the intern, and took me aside and said, you're not allowed to write because you're not in the guild, but if you can crack this story, I'll buy it, and we'll see if we let you write the script. And then they let me co-write the script. What's the name of the show? It's called Violations, and it was a 24th century rape story, which was right up my feminist alley. (laughs) And that brings me to the final question which is we're living in 2018 and we have a regime we don't want to name in the White House right now. As you're working on this at this point, what do you bring of the present day or do you avoid bringing anything of the present day to this? I think that we are living in a time where if we don't revolt and we don't institute, instigate, inspire, and activate change, The damage is going to be so, it's already profound, and it's going to be worse. And I think the 1969 and where Walk on the Moon takes place, when it takes place, where it takes place, how it takes place, is exactly the same. And I don't think we have to put any kind of pin spot on it because the young people in this world, it's their turn. They have to make change because I will tell you that the people in Washington are not instituting change. They're just saying yes, yes, yes. And, and talk about the power of the word no. And I think it was then and I think it's now. Yes. I mean, as we've built up Allison and Ross, 
it just naturally became an opportunity for her to express more of her politics. She hates Nixon. She hates the war. She's anti-gun. She's bringing this energy into the family, which is a lot of why this story happened to Pearl at that time. She's got the 1969 living in her home, and it was already there. You know, this isn't the first time we've hated a president. I'm Richard Walensky, and see you next Sunday for another edition of the Bay Area Theater Podcast.